This is uh, one of the regular meetings of the Colorado Music Business Organization combo, if, uh, if you're not already familiar. Um, and we, uh, we are the, we've been around for 20 years. Uh, you can find out more about us at coloradomusic.org. We're a membership uh, driven organization and we're, we're trying to help out the business end of the music business. Um, trying to help musicians negotiate the business part so they don't get ripped off all the time. Uh, and whatever we can do to help. Wow, I really am not prepared for this. <laughs> that's Barbara, okay, David. That, that's Barbara, okay. There? <laughs> um, uh, you want to jump in, Sheena? Sure, sure. Colorado all, uh, Combo, so uh, that's short for Colorado Music Business Organization. Um, we're also about uh, supporting and educating uh, the Colorado music scene. And so we do host monthly meetings like this one today um, to help with, on a, a number of different um, topics um, to try to educate, as David had mentioned, to help um, put the power in the artist's hands about how to deal with mu uh, the music business. And um, um, so yeah, so thank you, Ian, for uh, bringing this up. I want to I want to give you um, a huge shout out. Um, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention, um, coming to us and asking us to put on this meeting, um, prompted by Corey, who is one of our uh, guests tonight. Um, so, uh, Ian, I'm going to hand it over to you. Sure, absolutely. Um, I want to start by saying thanks to everybody who's tuning in today and let them know that this conversation that we're going to have today doesn't stop here. That I have been uh, working with Combo, and we have a commitment that we're going to be working on a series to bring a wide variety of voices. There's no way in one panel you can represent the entire amount of diversity in human beings um, and, and their work in this workplace. And so, you know, I'm really grateful that we're having this conversation now because the industry um, has slowed down. It gives us a lot of opportunity for us to really examine how the industry is structured and how we want to move forward in the future. And that includes virtual online uh, events. You know, I think the music events, uh, the music industry is really turned to online into festivals. And I'm curious tonight to find out whether or not that really levels the playing field. We were going to start by going around and uh, letting our panelists talk a little bit about themselves. About five minutes would be great. And then we're going to get into some questions. Um, but just to begin with, you know, my name is Ian Tafoy. I've worked in the industry for about 10 years. I got my very first gig, uh, volunteer gig, actually, working for City Park Jazz. And I ended up becoming the vice uh, president of the City Park Jazz Board went on to do a whole bunch of different kinds of festivals, uh, Denver Cruiser Rides, I've worked on the 420 uh, Rally, uh, Capitol Hill People's Fair, um, Single Day Mile has been fun uh, just to even join in on because Andrea's mother uh, was one of the founders and I had a chance uh, to just hang out there. And it's a wonderful experience, cultural experience. All these things bring us together. Uh, I worked on a music television show as a talent buyer and a host and a booker. Um, and, uh, now I'm a DJ on KGNU and I host a show on KGNU. And so I've worked across the industry, um, even for Superfly with the Grand Doozy community engagement with the underground music showcase. And time and time again, I often found myself to be the only, uh, black, uh you know, in person of color, uh, working. Sometimes I would work with one black person. Sometimes I've worked with one Asian person. I tend to see some more parody between men and women, I work with a lot of really amazing female promoters. But again, I think that these are mostly white women. And so this, this larger conversation, you know, I came across Corey's article and I said, man, this is totally spot on. There's a huge problem here. And I want to know how we're going to get to the other side. And so that's why we started bringing folks together. And, you know, Andrea, I was hoping we could start with you. You could just talk to us a little bit about yourself and the work that you do in the industry. Sure. Um, my name's Andrea Barella. Um, I'm the um, CEO of a nonprofit organization called New Said Community Development Corporation. Um, as in kind of mentioned there, um, it's an organization that was started by my mom, Veronica Barella. 
Uh, Mom is one of the founders of the Denver Cinco de Mayo Festival. Um, and we carry on that tradition today. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to have Cinco this year, so it was a huge loss for for the community and for, for NUSED. Um, but um, our organization, uh, you know, we put on that event um, as a fundraiser for NUSED. And so I've been a part of Cinco de Mayo since way back when it started on Santa Fe Drive as a small community festival. And it's grown to be um, the largest cultural event in the state of Colorado. Um, and one of the largest, if not the largest Cinco de Mayo in the country. So we, um, when you when you think about, you know, how do we, with a big, big scale event in three stages, how do we coordinate um, the music piece of Cinco? And that's typically done through our partnerships with radio stations. And um, so we work with some, some Mexican radio stations, some, some local groups like Jammin 1015, groups like that. And, you know, we work together to uh, figure out uh, how to innovate, entertain crowds on, on, that, on that Cinco de Mayo weekend. Um, the event would have been, um, we would have been having our 32nd annual this year. Sorry, our 33rd annual this year. And um, uh, never has our event been interrupted. So, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a loss with COVID this year, but, um, you know, hopefully people celebrated Cinco in their own ways at home with a glass of margarita. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, that's, that's a little bit about my background. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate uh, being asked to be a part of it. Today's Andrea, day. could you just speak for a second about your time on the Colorado Festival and Event Association and how, how that operates? Because it's similar to, to Combo here. Sure. Um, I used to serve um, on the board of um, the Colorado Festival and Events Association, CFEA. That's a member-based organization made up of um, industry professionals, folks that service the event industry, the, the festival industry and specifically, and then folks who produce those events. Um, so, you know, I'm, um, we work very closely with a lot of festival producers, um, Renee Ortiz's group and Eventful Production being one of them. Um, and then just a whole slew of contractors that we have come to know as family um, over the years who, who've worked with very, who have worked with us very closely. But CFEA is a great member organization. They've been around 20 plus years now and um, they hold an annual conference. Typically it takes place in some location in Colorado, but basically it's, you know, two days, sometimes three days of um, intensive workshops on various event related um, topics. And, um, you know, I've, I've been able to teach sessions um, uh, about um, community inclusion and um, other such topics with marijuana is always a topic, of course. And so um, it's a great, it's a great organization. Uh, they have about 200 members. I really encourage anybody that is wanting to expand their knowledge and their, and their um, connectivity to the festival and event community to join CFBA um, and um, get to know them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Johnny Johnson, I'd like to go to you next. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm, I'm with um, InterVision and I work with disabled uh, uh, music artists to teach the, the business of music. And how I started was uh, in 90s, well, I started in, in 1990 just doing uh, public access TV shows. Then in 97, I, I switched it over to like music acts. Yeah, the music acts, and I started booking music bands on the show, and then we switched over to Channel 12, which that surprised the public access guys because they thought I was going to only do it, you know, at their the little station there, but I wanted to really open this up. And then uh, I noticed a lot of these bands, they would, they would say like, you know, hey, can you get us, can you book us in venues? And I, and I, and I would always ask them like, you know, do you have a fan base? Because I know these places... You know, they just don't want to have a band rehearsing there. They want to have people buying drinks and all that other stuff. So I would do a a, a, a mixed show of, of artists, like from hip hop to rock to um, what whatever else, and you know, charge five dollars at the door, and then bring in a camera guy and film it, and then I would use that footage 
for my TV shows. Um, and then I guess when I wanted to, to go out further like north and stuff like that, then I, I found that some other guys, well, one guy, he had blocked off all these you know, uh, central city and stuff like that. So he, he, you have to go through him to get his bands, get any bands there to, to make the higher money. So I, I went back downtown and I found if I wanted to get paid and I wanted to get the band paid, uh, playing downtown venues was, was the best way to go. Um, and, and I did get paid some um, booking bands in smaller clubs, but I found that the really good money was, was booking these guys downtown. So I got a, a main crew of like maybe like three bands that I knew that they had a draw. Um, they would pretty much promote themselves and, and, and they would be the, the draw because their name, they, they did the circuit and, and they really, you know, they had their, their fan base uh, uh, set in there. And then I, so I go from that to like one time I wanted to book this one group and they said they, um, they had a great fan base. And I, I could always tell like who had a fan base by put the tickets on sale on, online and see how those sales are, are going. Then I would know for sure. But these guys said, you know, book Grizzly Rolls and, and we'll really bring them in. And I said, let's fill a place of 50 people and then the next show I'll take his Grizzly Rolls. Well, I, I booked that show uh, for this place that hold 50 people and they brought in three fans. And I said, man, I would really be embarrassed if I would have got this 500 venue with three people. So I learned a lot of this stuff by trial and error. Um, I can't tell you if there was any other blind people doing this because I couldn't see anybody. So I, I, as far as I know, I was the only blind guy in the venues that I picked out. And I came across very um, um, inclusive people, uh, like the, the lady that, that does the, the Mercury Cafe, uh, other people that did, had venues out in Aurora, um, uh, Lakewood, and and especially like downtown when I would book at the, the bottoms up um, place in, in the Supreme Court. And well, it's no longer the Supreme Court, it's the, the Sheridan now. So it, 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 was, it's been, it was a learning experience and made a lot of mistakes, but, but it was enjoyable to do, to be on that end of, of these guys, great positions, they needed a venue, they, they knew how to do this music stuff, but they just needed someone to, to get their foot in the door and then, you know, sometimes handle the, the money stuff and uh, handle like arranging the, the pay, but, but pretty much they knew how to do that as well. So it was like a, a partnership that I really enjoyed and, and uh, it was fun. So, so, so Intervision, that's, that's what we do. And, and uh, right now we, we had, we had a, a concert book for April where um, it was going to be at Mercury Cafe, 300 people, <laughs> the 18th of, of April. And of course that went out, so I rescheduled it and hopefully, you know, in October will be over or maybe we'll, we'll see what happens. So that's it. Hey, thank you. I do want to note that the program had Ryan Fu on it. And unfortunately he had a cancel just a couple hours ago. He's working, uh, he's an independent event producer himself and works with the Black Actors Guild. And they're putting on something called Colfax Canvas on uh, August 1st. If anyone wants to go check it out, they're painting a whole bunch of murals up and down Colfax. And so he said he had to go get his hands in the paint. So he's hopefully going to come back in August and we can have him on here. Uh, Andy, I'd love to go to you next. Andy Rock Guerrero. Hello, everybody can hear me. How's it going? Um, hey, I know a decent yes. amount of you. I know Amy and uh, some former students, Kelsey here. I know Edwina from Youth on Record uh, and Dave from the Herman Hideaway days. As, as you may or may not tell, I've been into the Colorado music scene for plus 20 years. I started gigging when I was 15 years old, um, playing uh, um, over on 17th, uh, it wasn't the Gypsy Cafe, it was something else. Like, I'm so old, I can't even remember the name of venues that don't exist anymore. <laughs> but um, uh, my name is Andy Guerrero. Um, um, I'm a Chicano uh, musician, producer, 
songwriter. Um, I founded um, the band Flowbots and Bob Schism, um, and recently uh, re-engaged with Flowbots, so I'm, I'm doing that again. Um, and uh, I'm also a professor um, of music business at the University of Colorado at Denver. Um, and uh, you know, I've done it. I've played shows. I've managed some bands. I've uh, done just about everything, you know, in the music business. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just, uh, and I've been around the scene a long time. I grew up in the scene and it, you know, helped form me, uh, you know, and Colorado has been really great um, to me as a Latino artist. Um, and not that there's a lot of things we have to work on, but um, I can definitely speak from experience of coming up and seeing where it is now and being around college students and seeing some of the struggles that they have to deal with. Um, you know, and students that have other people of color and, and other things like that. So, um, so yeah, I'm just here as a resource um, to help answer any questions um, and, uh, you know, see what I can add to the conversation. Um, I was saying I saw the first time I ever saw you play that I can remember was uh, with Bob Schism for a Waka Rusa. So you guys could try to go to Waka Rusa. And you were, you were stellar. Tenerto played that day. Um, Sun Squab you played that day, you know, it's just some really great bands. That was a good time. Um, you know, Corey, I want to go to you next. And, and, and after you explain who, you know, you are to the rest of us, I think I'd, we want to begin with you. And we really want to go into, you know, what really prompted you to write this article? And uh, what were you seeing, you know, just in your time here um, that, gave, you know, that got you to write this? What was it like to work with your editors to get it pushed through? Yeah. Um, to give a little bit of a background, I have been working in the music industry for like seven years now. Uh, I got my start at the University of Arizona. I was working in one of the theaters down there at the Rialto. And then I moved back here. I grew up in Denver, but I moved back here after college. And yeah, quickly started with uh, 303 Magazine. And at the time, I was just a staff writer and kind of grew the position with them to being a talent buyer and a photographer and also like an event coordinator with them when we do put on events and whatnot. So it's kind of been like a, oh, and I've also like taken on artist management in recent years and just like it's a full kind of 360 type of position now that didn't exist before, but that's kind of my backstory. Um, if you, I, I can just jump into like kind of why, where the article came from. Um, so having covered the music scene for specifically the Denver music scene for almost five years now, um, it was very just apparent in like the meetings I would go to and with promoters and I, you get to learn a lot of the people in the industry and a lot of people around you're in these rooms, you're talking to these people, you're writing stories on them. And it had come to, <clears throat> it come to my attention that it was just like, so white dominated, even though there were other people of color around and in adjacent places, but in the positions that really controlled how we perceive music and how we interact with music in Denver, there weren't any, I wasn't seeing any people of color. And it was a question I'd asked at several panels I'd go to um, off and on, just like a couple of music industry panels where I'd asked about what the, diversity would look like in Denver and like how that would be reflected and like what people were doing to better reflect that. And it was always a question that was just falling on deaf, like deaf ears. It was always ignored. It was always this weird awkwardness in the air. It's like, this is a problem. And even my own experiences with it in terms of like how I've been perceived in these meetings and like opportunities I've been passed up for in the same breath to people that have either been not qualified but we're still white. And I just like, I, it was something that I had never understood. And like me writing that article was basically me trying to open up that conversation. And it's something that we talked about so many times with other people in these higher positions of like, okay, this is a recognized thing. So why are, why aren't we talking about it? And so by putting out that article, I feel like it really did help to open up that conversation. At least I don't know if, if they're going to take enough action on it, but I wanted that to put it out there. And in terms of writing it, it, I definitely had my reservations of putting it out there because I didn't want it to be misconstrued. Um, 
with editors, we had, we followed up with a lot of people. We reached out to a lot of these um, organizations that do have a huge stake in Denver and creating our music scene. And we would just talk to them and we wanted to see like what their statements were on it. I've wanted to write this article for four years, but it, I think it took this time when people are actually paying attention and wanting to look at racial diversity and look at that disparity seriously that it, the timing also worked out. So that's kind of where that came from. And that's like, yeah, it wasn't easy to write. It was like, I had qualms, I, not qualms, but I had apprehension about having to name names and name organizations, not to be vindictive towards them, but be like, if I don't name it, if I don't call it out, if I don't mention you in this, then you're not gonna, you're gonna act like it's just not a problem. And I wanted the actual problem to be at the forefront. And so naming names was something that like I was concerned about in the beginning, but like it ended up being better because even people from those organizations later on reached out and be like, how can we, some did, some didn't at all, but some took it upon themselves to be like, hey, how can we do better? And then that was huge in terms of like actually getting action to go behind the yeah, for action to come out of the words I put down on paper. So yeah, that's kind of where that all came from. Well, thank you for, for sharing your story about how you got there. And um, Andrea, I'm wondering if we can go back to you and you could talk to us a little bit about your experience. You know, you, you run one of the largest cultural festivals in the country, really. And yet it seems like it's hard to access, is it hard to access sponsorship? Is it hard to break into the mainstream or do you think that, you know, mainstream culture comes and celebrates for one day and then they don't respect the culture the rest of the time? Hmm. You know, um, one of, one of the, the, the beauties of the, the Cinco de Mayo festival is that it, it, it was a pretty organic um, festival that came about out of community community want and a want to celebrate and then that's actually the the tagline for the event is celebrate culture so we've kept that all these years because you know we at Cinco while it may be um, I mean it's definitely uh, the the day to celebrate and recognize Mexican culture um, at home um, we feature a lot of different cultures at that event and so um, and that's reflected through our vendors and our food that's featured. And, and so that's, that's why we adopted that tag celebrate culture a long time ago. Um, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we, we've been asked to take our event in a lot of different directions over the years. And my, my stance has always been, you know, um, this is this is this is our week. This is our our time to celebrate um, what's beautiful and um, important about Mexican history and Mexican culture. I know that Cinco de Mayo. It's something that I've heard a billion times over the years. Is that well? It's not even celebrated in Mexico. Well, that's not necessarily true. It is celebrated. It's not celebrated at the level we do in the United States. Um, but it is, it is a, it is, it is, is it, it's a significant event, event for our, for our community. We have a very big mix of Chicano and, and Mexicanos communities in Colorado. And so, um, we, we, I, I don't apologize for the fact that we get to celebrate, um, what, what is unique and beautiful about Mexican cultural and history uh, on Cinco de Mayo. And I've had sponsors that want to do things like that are stereotypical that you see at other events, other taco festivals, other things like that, where people want to pull out the, the paper sombreros and the, the mustaches and that kind of thing. I refuse to have that kind of thing at our event. Um, I've had sponsors request that they have photo booths with that. And I just, I just flat out tell them, no, um, you know, that's not what our event is about. It's about authenticity and um, that's represented through our music and our food and our dance and uh, the parade and the, everything that we work hard to put together. Um, so we, we, we're, we're very, um, 
we're very big sticklers about that kind of thing. Um, and our staff and the, the staff that we include um, that puts on the event is intentionally diverse. Um, you know, there's a new said staff is intentionally diverse. It always has been from the beginning. And that's always been a very important um, reason why our organization has been successful for 47 years. And so once we start valuing um, diversity and once we start making it as the primary goal, that's when, <laughs> that's when all of our various industries will grow and get better uh, because culture and diversity make things better. Um, so once people start understanding that and going there first, as opposed to hiring the next best white person for those positions, um, you know, uh, these industries will grow. So that's how I feel about it. I don't know if I answered the question, <laughs> but. Um, no, I think, you know, I, it actually gave me some other questions here that I'm gonna come back to uh, in a little bit. You know, this one, this next one's for you, Andy, and I can't help but continue to think that if the industry is dominated at the top, and people are paying large amounts of money to go to university. How do you have these conversations with youth about this investment of time they're making into business, and yet there appears to be a glass ceiling or roadblocks in the way? And you know, and how do you mentor them? And you know, has this article really spurred a different conversation for you and your students? Um, well, first of all, I, Corey, I just want to say, man, thanks for writing that article. You know, there's I growing up in the scene and. Um, all the things you talked about, definitely, I, I feel you. <laughs> and um, I, it's a hard thing to write in Denver because, you know, we're a live music city, right? And there's a few people that run everything, right? It's AG, it's Live Nation. You know, I know you mentioned Francois. It's like, Francois is the only person of color that I worked with coming up, you know, and <laughs> that that's about it. Um, you know, that being said, with students, you know, me being, you know, a person of color, um, I, I, um, I find I have a really good relationship with, with other students who are people of color um, and I'm able to relate with them and talk about things. And basically number one thing is myself being a resource to them, right? I've done this, I've done certain things. I know how to handle things. I know who the players are. I can be, you know, I can give them some advice. And we're talking about, you know, color and diversity in, in Colorado. You know, I'm, you know, we can get really deep into this. Like I'm from the North side of Denver, right now heavily gentrified. When I grew up there, it was the hood, like people got shot and stuff. And uh, you know, I, um, in high school, busing was still allowed, like mandatory busing was still a thing. Right. So I'm a poor kid from the North side. Right. And, uh, I would have probably gone to North high school. I didn't want to go to North high school because my mom taught there <laughs> and I didn't want to go to high school where my mom taught. Um, and I was, but because busing was mandatory, I was allowed to go to George Washington High School. Okay, so I'm bused to George Washington High School, which is a probably at that point was probably one of the most mixed high schools in Denver Public Schools. Um, and but it's also there's a lot of rich white kids that are there. You know, I I and and uh, you know I don't meet Stefan. I don't meet the guys in the Flowbots and stuff. If I don't go to George Washington, Flowbots never happen. If certain things like busing, which don't happen anymore, which affected me as a person of color, to go to another place, meet new people, and have access, right, and have new opportunities, right? When we're talking about giving people of color in Colorado, you know, opportunities, it's about, it's about those opportunities, right? And it's about education, right? Like, the music business is hard. It is the hardest business I mean, there's a lot of hard business. Entertainment business, music business is extremely difficult to succeed in. I'm very lucky. You know, I always tell my students, luck is when preparation meets timing. Flowbots worked our butts off and we were prepared when the opportunity came for us to kind of go to the national level, right? Um, you know, and I put that, you know, I knew Stefan, I knew Jamie, and I put that entire band together, you know, um, same with Schism, whatever, lots of people of color, that's kind of who I came up with. Um, but, you know, I was also lucky to get a scholarship and go to CU, right? And then that gave me a whole other access to other people. I'm able to get an internship at the Gothic Theater, right? Again, owned by Steve Shock, but working with Matt Need, you know, a lot of white guys, but they're teaching me the ropes, right? They're showing me how to book shows, like how numbers work, how to promote things. I'm getting opportunities to do different things, all from white guys, you know, but 
it's the education piece that I think here is that is really important. You know, um, the music business is hard for everybody to figure out. And especially in Colorado, we're different. You know, we have a great live scene. We're not so much filled with, uh, you know, publishing and writing and stuff like in L.A. and New York. So we're always fighting to prove ourselves. But, um, you know, it's about education. Me being a young Latino kid, it was like, obviously, I worked hard. Um, but it was other people kind of giving me that education um, in order to help me get to that, that next level, right? So it's really about access and time and giving people those resources. You know, the music business is hard for anybody to figure out. And, you know, part of the reason we, we started Youth On, uh, so Flowbots founded a, a nonprofit called Youth On Record, um, you know, and part of the whole reason with that was yes to increase graduation rates, but I was trying to help kids like me, you know? How do you figure out, I love music. Music got me to graduate high school. Music got me to college. You know, I would have never done those things if I didn't love music so much, you know? Um, so, you know, I think when we're having this conversation, you know, this is great. Like, you know, all of you all have done different things in the music business and your experiences are really valuable, especially to young people of color in order to navigate this space. Um, and I think, giving people the tools to, you know, like, okay, you're going to promote a show. You need to promote a show. You have to get people there. This is what you need to do. If you don't sell a hundred tickets, these white promoters aren't going to take you seriously. If you sell out the bluebird, these white promoters will take you seriously, you know, and here's what you need to do to get to the next step and that get to the next step. Here's how you can do that. Here's how you can market. Here's how you can do those things. But, you know, people don't know these things and it's really about access and education. So, you know, I love my, I love the, the, the professor gig at, at CU. I, I've met so many talented students um, and I'm able just to give them my time and just sit down with them, you know, and, and say, Hey, okay, here's, here's how to navigate this space. And, um, you know, I, I think that's some of the best stuff I can do. And we, we all can do is just like be available um, to people and give them the education <laughs> and let them know how to deal with people. Cause um that's that's how bands succeed you know um so i don't know that's kind of my quick thoughts it's a super complicated topic but um can i ask I'm you a question speaking from a, a latino kid from from north side <laughs> you know that's my experience can i ask you a question is, is, yeah the, go ahead oh, Johnny. yeah yeah uh, go ahead what did you do with artists that said well i want you to sell the tickets and i just want to show up because I bet you have a lot of story. Okay, some artists will say, you know, I'm the I'm performer. I just want to show up, plug in, play the music, yeah. and I want you to, to to promote me and sell the tickets. When you're when you're dealing with these guys that are just coming up, yeah. What what do you say? To, what have you said to guys like that? Because I know you must have come across them. Oh yeah, I, I've I mean, come across it, them all the time. It, it really depends on a lot of things. Like, you know, when we're talking about elevating people of color you know um in general but like especially you know giving them opportunities like if i see extremely talented bands that i know like maybe they're having a little bit of a hard time promoting but if i put them in front of a crowd you know they will win that crowd over and they're going to get a bunch of fans and then the next time they play the, you know you know flowbots did that to the best of our ability i mean i i think uh i think i saw john shockness log on here maybe he he got off I thought I saw him on here, <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, when air Dubai was coming up, uh, you know, I, I produced them, you, you know, I, I saw them, I, I don't remember exactly. Maybe they opened for us on some college thing or something, you know, there's John, there's Julian. And I was like, Whoa, these kids are like really good. They need a little sharpening around the edges or whatever. They're really, they're like, you know, in height, they're like 18, whatever. Right. They're, they're have the energy. They're awesome. And so, I took, you know, I took it upon myself to like, I'm going to produce your album, you know? And I was like, you guys can open up for Flowbots at the Ogden and at some of these other shows and a couple of these other big things to like, be like, here's a band of color. These are young kids. They're doing it. Let's give them some spotlight. Let's give them some love and let's help them, you know, get to the next, next, next level. Um, when it comes to promotion, it's like, it's a hard game, Johnny, because I totally know where you're coming from. Like fans think like, oh, I'm great. And like, people are going to show up. And it's like, that's not how it works. It's still hard work. Unfortunately, part of the job of being a musician isn't just writing good music anymore. It's writing good music, 
being on social media, finding a way to connect with your audience, and then getting them to show up. And now I do think that there's lots of bands of color I mean, hip hop or any genre or whatever that are talented enough that if A and G like put them on as an opener at the Ogden or for some national act um, and, and they have their stuff together, they would gain more fans and then be able to sell out venues on their own and then be able to make, make money on their own. So, you know, like, you know, Flowbots to some degree, like, you know, um, I met Isaac in the fray at college, right? We wrote songs together. I booked all the phrase first shows, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, when it came around to Flowbots, kind of, we were just about to break. They gave us a huge opportunity. They let us open for them at Red Rocks, you know, to a sold out crowd. We were about to release our CD, our, our CD. We had a show booked at the Gothic. We didn't have any radio play at that, at that point. Them putting us on at that show, resold like 300 CDs. We, you know, and that helped us sell out the Gothic, which then got us an agent, a national booking agent, which then got us to the next spot, you know? So, um, so there were things like that where we were prepared, we're, we're a band of color, we're working hard. And then some people are putting us on and helping us get to that, that next level. But, you know, I, I think, I think Johnny's like in the music business, like people say they can bring people, but they don't, they don't promote, you know, and that's the real thing in the music industry, you know, like you gotta do it. Yeah. Andrew, you, sorry. I'm talking. You know, you no, no, it's totally fine. I, it's so funny because you're saying what business could be harder than this. And I think Andrea knows because her mother ran for office and she works in politics. They're so much the same. You know, when I ran for yeah, city council, I I, I'm, I'm harder. yeah, <laughs> well, when I ran for city council, I saw so much of the same conversation, right? You could have the best product in the world. You could have a person who is amazing in their spirit, but if they don't have the, the show performance on camera, then they don't play as well. Um, if they're not willing to put in the hard work to go knock the doors, they're not going to make it. And, you know, the votes is just like selling tickets, you know, and the politics is, is so deep in all of this. When you're talking about busing and education and access and permits, I mean, it all comes back to politics in a lot of ways. And I think that Kaylin is a perfect example of somebody who really brought that kind of cultural diversity to the forefront and said, hey, like in the music industry and in politics, I've literally had a claw every moment of my day to get here. And Andrea, I see your hand up. I want to go back to you right now. Let's go to you now. Well, just what resonated me with what Andy was talking about is how important it is to build relationships. It's super, super, super important. And I, that's obviously for any industry, but especially in the art industry, especially in the music industry and in the festival industry, relationships are everything. And I, I feel that people of color tend to be intimidated about building relationships outside of their own cultural network. Um, I, I produced an event called Sunnyside Music Festival from 2015 to 2017. They needed an executive director. I did it as a side gig to what I was already doing. And, um, and this was before I became director at Newsed. But I really, um, I, as a person of color, injected myself into an all white organization. And that was um, really stepping outside of my comfort zone. But it, I knew that I would learn things that would be applicable to Cinco de Mayo and, and everything else that I do. I would be able to form relationships and I would be intentional about it. And I would teach them because to be honest, they, 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 they needed help. They needed help making that, that event more professional and raising the bar on it. And I, as a person of color was able to bring that to that organization. And I'm very proud of the work that I was able to do there. And you, and I don't feel like I answered your question fully because you had asked about sponsorships. Um, sponsorships in, in, the, in the festival industry, we, we're, we're lucky because we have three decades, right, of, or, of doing this event. And we have the luxury of thousands and thousands of people that come um, to the event to celebrate. And we have the added luxury of having um, the attention of a demographic of people we get 70% Latino attendance at Cinco de Mayo. So that in and of itself is attractive to certain sponsors. Some sponsors it's not, but we don't want those. We want the ones that want to appeal to our demographic. And, um, you know, it's, it's basically business from there. 
it's relationship building, of course. I've had sponsors we've worked with for literally 25 years. We still have sponsors that we've had from the very beginning with Cinco. They, they are a part of it, and we make them feel a part of it, and we thank them, and we, we do all the necessary uh, legwork you're supposed to do with an event. Um, before, during, and after. And um, sponsorship cultivation, just like the music industry, is all about relationship building. I think that we need to understand how important that is. Um, young people, you can't build a relationship on social media exclusively. You have to get your ass out there and you have to be intentional and put yourself in spaces that are going to be uncomfortable for you. So get out of your stupid bubble or whatever and stop being all about your emotions and go out there and meet people. Um, it's important. And we don't teach our young people that. I, I think that I think that, that social media platforms have taken the, the place of that. And that's not going to get you anywhere in this industry. Um, and so I, I, just wanna, I just wanted to really make that point. Um, so. And just to piggyback on what you were saying, like I, I totally – uh, agree you know like i'm really proud that like we have places like youth on record where like you can like you know be in person working on music and you know we've been able to bring you know like um uh bring in 21 pilots or something you know and we have some students actually perform with them and they're like in the studio you know this was probably like in 2016 or something in range 2016 but they agreed to come in we had some students from youth on record there and they just like sat in the studio and they're like telling them about how they came up and like recording drums and doing vocals like hey you guys can use this however you want and then you know and then they performed with them at the gothic that night you know and we did the same thing with um imagine dragons or you know so it's like you're getting these kids you're like getting these amazing opportunities um and building those relationships right like meeting people being like okay maybe i don't know this but maybe i can go to youth on record and they might know this promoter or they can hook me up with andy or they can hook me up you know and you have oza motley or you have other people coming in who do this all the time just to get some of that access and build relationships you know oh hey i'm that kid at youth on record i met you that one time send an email you know next time you come through could i interview you for my blog or whatever right like that in-person connection is so important especially in our industry all right now so i just want to piggyback on that oh and i wanted to ask this question as well okay like i, I know youth on records and stuff like that um starting the young people out is there ways that you've been able to go into high school because and, and have them work in front of an audience because I, I noticed when I was studying as a DJ, learning how to work an audience, that is very important to the show. So who of you like um, the lady that does Oh, Johnny, about? you yeah. are, I love you so much. This is like, this is partially what I teach at the university when I, I, I direct. So I created the first ever hip hop ensemble at CU because hip hop's like a pop media, you know, it's like, it's, the music <laughs> right now and we didn't have an ensemble doing so I created um a first ever kind of hip-hop ensemble and um you know I have a pop rock ensemble as well and I basically put these college kids together every semester it's like potentially a new group of students never played together before and I, that's what I teach them is how to perform and I book a show at like Lost Lake or Larimer Lounge or something like that so that they get the real experience of playing in a sweaty club at night, you know, with monitors not working and whatever else that may be. And we'll learn a series of covers. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that's what I, um, I, I work on them with is like, how do you engage an audience, how to perform, how to make connections. And one thing I'm trying to work with on Youth on Record is, um, again, it's about access, right? So through my things, I've been able to work with people in Nashville who like, there's people who do this as a living. They like work on Taylor Swift's tour and they like figure out all the songs and like when you're going to do what, when, and how you're going to do this and how you're going to interact with the audience. Right. And really for people in Colorado and any musician, you're going to make the majority of your money playing live. Like 70% of your income is probably going to be live. Then it's going to be from streaming and publishing and anything else you get. So having a solid live performance is really how you survive. I mean, Beyonce and Jay-Z, yes millionaires right but like they make 250 million dollars from their tour not from their records like their records and publishing is maybe 20 or 30 million which is still a lot but if you think in comparison to their last tour that was like 250 million 300 million dollars right so um so i'm trying to do a workshop that, um there's some folks that i work with um and i use this as a reference for my students uh, it's like this guy tom jackson is on stage success 
com. I think you guys can go check it out. I'll put a link or something. Um, but this guy wrote a book on that, <laughs> basically on like how to perform, how to build a set list, how to engage with the audience, how to hold the mics, like, and, and it's really simple language. And so I take a lot of my cues from that and, um, you know, trying to teach, uh, you know, my students how to do that. But you're so right, Johnny. It's like, you know, that's what Advantage Flowbots have. We worked really hard. We played a lot of gigs and we worked on our live show, you know, and we got to the point where we were like a slam and live band and you put us in front of a, you know, the fray or whatever. Right. And we still like crush it. And people were like, what's this band about? I want to know. And that's how you gain new fans. So um, I, I think that's, I'm trying to do some workshops where I can host that. And um, usually what I'll do is we'll get a band and then they will be like on stage and they'll play a song and then um, myself and this other person would work with them live to redo an entire song or performance. And then by the time it's done, it's like, whoa, this is amazing. And then it, you know, everybody learns in the process, but yeah, okay. man, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole thing. Also the lady that uh, she does the, um, the I'm, I'm, I forgot your name. Um, the Cinco de Mayo. Do you ever um, uh, put out things in, in the schools like for people who want to, who, who you can mentor into that kind of position of people of color so they can, see how it's done and get over that intimidation feeling because they're seeing you doing it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, some of that mentoring I've been able to do as a, when I was board member of CFEA, um, new said as an organization, our mission is so focused on affordable housing and small business development. Um, we haven't really done um, outreach to the festival um, for, producer community specifically we have different relationships in in different ways but that's a great idea <laughs> that's a fantastic idea and I, um and it's it's business development right it's a form of it and uh it, it is something that we do at new said so i think that's a great idea i'll send you some i'll send you some interns please send them i need them <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Specifically, people of Latinos I, or people of I mean, color. <laughs> I've been I've been asked to guest speak at at um uh uh is it a oh Red Rocks Community College because they have an event uh, planning department. Um, the the city of Parker has asked me to speak, and it, I've been asked to speak at some things, and and I've, I'm always available to. Um, I've, I've done a, a ton of interviews with students that have asked me how, how we've come to, to be, you know, a large event like we are. And, um, I'm, I'm, I always, I'll drop everything and, and, and speak to a student any day. And, um, I, I understand how important that is because people just want to learn. Um, and you know, there's, there's so many people at different stages in, 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 in their, um, professional development that want to get into this area that, um, you know, it's, I, I gotta tell you, just like the music industry, event production is hard. It's hard goddamn work. And you're putting in, you know, over a hundred hours a week sometimes. And because at the end of the day, <laughs> if that event doesn't go well, that's, that's your reputation. And, you know, you gotta, you gotta do everything you can to plan, plan, plan. Cause what's the old saying? If you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And, and I'll be damned. I'll be damned if we put on an event and we haven't worked really hard at it and made sure it was fun for everybody and accessible for everybody. How, how, many, times, how many times have we had that go the wrong way? I feel like there's times when I've planned, planned, planned and no one shows up. And then there's something that you're like, oh, I'm not going to put that much effort. And then you're at capacity or something. Um, I, you know, you're talking about interns and I want to switch. I, I had heard uh, Johnny and I want to go to you here too, Corey, after him. You know, Johnny, you were telling us about how you got started, and I'm going to ask Corey, you know, to tell us about your first gig, but, you know, Johnny, where, what was the job, or where, where were you at in your career when you thought, man, maybe I can actually make a go in this, because I know personally, it took me several years of, like, some good gigs, some bad gigs, before I finally felt like I was in an established place, and like, yeah, this was going to be a regular source of income for me. Well, it was kind of weird. Um, I have a friend who who's also blind, who also started up this, the nonprofit with me. And I sort of like, we were in, in LA and I was seeing how they were doing it in LA and they're a little bit more, I don't know what, what it is about LA and, and all that stuff, but they were a little bit more organized. And, and so I, I got to see like the, the organization around him do it first and saw the craziness with 
you know, g uh, finishing a gig and driving out and been some bang gangsters try to steal your instruments and, and they pull out their guns and you, they, you pull out your guns and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I got to see all this, the insides of craziness and the business side. Then when I came back to Denver, um, my, the one that I said, I can do this was, it was at a, a little Creole restaurant in, in um, 2004, where it was a hip hop concert and I was doing the sound and I had booked a lot of the acts, but, but it was like packed and it was hostile and it was hip hop, uh, testosterone kind of thing. And I said, yeah, this could really work. So it, I mean, it was 2004, Creole restaurant, place was packed. I had some artists I needed to get on the stage. They had to fight their way to the stage because nobody wanted to hear nothing that was hardcore because my artists were not hardcore. And so the other guys that were hardcore, they didn't want to hear any, and, and, and just saying, hey, I'm not gonna do the sound if my artists don't get on that stage. And, and, and just making a stand in a room where I could have, they could even say, oh, well, who's this blind guy? Kick him out of the way, we'll take over the board. But um, that was when I said, I, I could do this and, and, and even in a hostile atmosphere, don't be afraid, just go for it. And that was pretty much it. It was all game, all, you know, the game was on. So Corey, I'd like to go to you. Yeah, about. Yeah. Sorry. About how like my first gig. Ever. Your first gig. Your first gig, and when did you think like, man, like I'm gonna make this? Oh, my first gig was in Tucson, Arizona, at the Rialto, and I was just like a marketing intern. But like I, I don't know. I just like I fell in love with it. Like I had always loved music, and I had always been that had always given me like joy in my life. And yeah, there's not a lot of venues in Tucson. There's only about like, only a handful. So it was one of the few places I could go. And I ended up staying there. I was the longest intern they, they ever had. I like worked my ass off and I would just show up and stay there and just like, until they were gonna kick me out, I wasn't planning on leaving. Until, I mean, besides graduation, of course. But yeah, I just, yeah, I got into it and I just fell in love and then coming back out here, it was different because that was not my intention. I was gonna move off to LA or somewhere and to a bigger music market. So when I came back here, I was like, I immediately wanted to get involved. And while I didn't see myself as a writer, um, well, I had been a writer, but I didn't see that as like something I was gonna do long term but that's kind of where i got my foot in the door is writing and i was got to know so many amazing musicians and the scene so well because of it it was like a tool that also became something i never imagined it could be so it's like yeah showed up and made sure i was like seen and made sure that like i was representing something that they didn't have Andrea, same question for you and Andy. Can you go after Andrea? Yeah, sure. Actually, I just wanted to, I know Kelsey had a question here, um, uh, you know, about, she says diversity is great, but I feel we also need to focus on inclusion as a black female and rock, rock band. I feel like there's a big lack of inclusion in certain parts of the scene. How do we make sure that outreach is there so black women uh, can feel included? And I don't know if you want to talk about a little bit more, uh, Kelsey. Um, I'm happy to like talk about that. I just want to make sure we're, we're getting those those questions and stuff. Yeah, definitely, definitely see them here in the chat. Um, there's this one, that question actually goes along with another one that came in the chat um, from Facebook about women of color in the industry. We have a question after this one, if you all don't mind waiting, that has to do with whether the industry is really accessible to everyone and why or why not. Sure. But thank you for acknowledging it. We definitely, um, Kelsey, I'll make sure that if anybody else writes a question that I'll, I'll say I'll get to it because I'm definitely keeping track of them here. Awesome. So Andrea, can, uh, we, can we just finish up this question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, what were you, were you talking about gigs or? 
Um, Your first gig, I think you kind of said you were like 15 years old or something when you started. Yeah, um, and where yeah, did you, when mom, did you think you were going to make it? My drove me in her station wagon and I took my Marshall, ha- drove me in my station wagon with my Marshall half stack and dropped me off. And I like pulled it out <laughs> and I like went to set up to, to play. Oh, Euphrates. That's what it was. Does anybody remember Euphrates Cafe? Is anybody old like me in Denver? Okay. Yeah, David knows. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that was like in high school, one of the few places we, you know, you could play. Um, and, you know, um, and my experience was a little interesting because in high school, you know, I learned really early on to be a shameless promoter. And one thing I really liked about music um, at, you know, I was like, you know, I was like, you know, middle school, elementary school, you know, picked on, bullied, like all that stuff. Right. And when, again, I got to go to high school, it kind of got, I got a fresh start. I got to meet new people. Right. I got to get to this new uh, experience. And um, one thing I loved about starting, I started a band in high school called, called the function. And actually the bass player from that band ended up being the bass player for Flowbots. Um, but uh, I, I try to use that as inclusion because I would invite everybody to the shows, right? So it's like the cheerleaders would come and the jocks would come and the drama kids would come and the nerds would, you know, like, like my whole thing with playing shows and music was like invite everybody. I wanted everybody to feel like they could come to our shows and hang out and be a part of it. And there's like this one thing that brought everybody together, all the crews, all the cliques, you know um that's what music's about right like we're you know we're all from different backgrounds political beliefs whatever but we all can love the same song right and that's what's so magical and powerful about music and why it's such a powerful force um you know and coming up just like you know um like i see chris k here you know i I was like in college like 18 or 19 and he was booking clubs in fort collins you know and again trying to expand i don't really know like how do i book a show in fort collins like you know we don't have friends that go there you know playing to some empty rooms you know um you know but Chris being like hey I think this band is good though you know hey here's some things you can try to do to get some more people out here and not like shunning us you know like Bob Schism also a band of color you know like not shunning us off right away and trying to be like okay guys like here's what you need to do like the college is down the street you need to go work the college and try to get college kids to come and we can make it 18 and plus for these certain things and you can try to pre-sell some tickets to that and then slowly build up and then it's like okay here's this festival thing i you know you guys maybe only brought 50 people this time but like i'm going to throw you on this festival thing because i think if i put you in front of these kids you'll bring more people to the club you know next time you play or whatever and like um you know and other allies you know like amy's here like you know learning social media like is not you know even though i come up with it with my, you know MySpace to Facebook to Twitter to it's always changed, you know, now it's TikTok. It's like, oh, every day it's like something new. Uh, but, you know, a- Amy took her time with Bob Schism, you know, or again, another band of color to, to help us educate us and, and be like, okay, guys, let me help you make your website. Let me get pictures for you. Let me, you know, here's how Twitter works. Here's how Facebook works. Here's how you need to do this. Here's how you have to do this and post this stuff. And, so that people can see it and, you know, um, uh, search engine optimization and, you know, all these things, but that's just her giving our band her time, right? There's a white woman given this, you know, <laughs> schism, you know, like a very multicultural band, you know, her time trying to help us learn, learn these different things. So um, I just want to give some shout outs to, to some of those folks, but yeah, you know, like, just like everybody else, so you when, made it when? when? When when did you make it? Yeah, well, when did you make like you when, made it? You make it when somebody sets up your equipment for you and all you have to do is show up and play a show. That is that is when you hire somebody to set up your gear and you just have to show up and play. That's I think when when somebody did when we hired people to do that, I was like, we can hire people to do this for us. We don't have to set it all up ourselves. That Amen. Was when I felt like, Amen. <laughs> I felt like, hey, We've we've hit a new we've hit a new milestone uh, on the success ladder, but um, but yeah, I mean Denver's been great for 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 anything. You know, one thing I, I definitely want to go to Andrea, but Corey, I was really interested because I know you've been doing events and like it's obviously a different time now, right? Like you know, different sponsorships and different ways that people are doing events and having to have social media and all these things and like you know, just some of your experiences with with that, you know, like the good and the bad, you know, because I think 
you like me probably love a lot of artists here in Colorado and you want to give them some shine, right? And you want to be like, you know, it's like John or Kayla, Marquis or like, you know, like all these people that are awesome. And it's like, people need to see these people, right? Like, yeah. how can we give them some more love? But you're like, okay, but I got to get them there and then market it and then get some money to pay the bands and do the sound. And you're like, oh, is anybody going to show up? <laughs> I'm sure. But I just love to hear your, your experience on, on some of that because that might help relate to the article and some of the things you're talking about potentially. Yeah. It's definitely a interesting thing to like book out a lot of these local shows. Um, with 303, we have this, we always tend to want to have a very diverse representation. It's very important to us. And we take it a very curated approach to being like, okay, these faces might be fresh, but it's like, in terms of how are we going to mark this event be like, true tastemakers, but also show the people that don't always get booked for the big music events in Denver. And like, for whatever reason, they're very talented, but we also want to make it a statement. They're like, okay, you may not know you, you may not know you don't like, like you don't know what you don't know. Um, yeah. And like, it's, it's been wonderful because like I've been able to use this platform to give, give these opportunities to people and try to do more. Before COVID, we were going to do, we had like this uh, series of Live Nation that we had just sorted out. And the first one was going to happen in, I think, early April. Yeah, early April. But it obviously got canceled. But it was stuff like that. And just like having that presence that just like kept it really interesting. Yeah. Did that answer that question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I just want to, you know, and, and just like, having to work your way in there and like, you know, get respect, right? Like as a person of color and, and you know, oh, yeah. Yeah, I want to put on this event. I want to do all this and just, you know, what dealing with that. A lot of people don't realize and like, it kind of goes back to some of the earlier comments about um, getting into places you're not getting out of your comfort zone. Uh, it's never ceased to amaze me how it feels to walk into a room and not see anyone that looks like you or anyone that's close to that. And like in terms of speaking up and like saying your ideas, it's, it's intimidating because they don't know this perspective. This perspective mm -hmm. is not seen anywhere else around you. So it's like even stepping up into those places and being like, I want to do this and we should do this because I feel like this matters. I feel like what we're doing out here matters. So sh we want more representation that way. And like I, if, I, if I can get into those rooms, and do that and bring it out and like i i love it like it's but it is challenging it's very challenging and also the whole aspect of selling tickets and making sure people come out for these things it's a lot of how you like market these situations like um we had this huge cover jam situation and we i wanted to have los smokochetes uh be the basically a house band for the night um, I want because I love what they bring to the scene. I want the, I wanted that. I wanted they're their awesome. Yeah, they're, 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 they're great. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but like we also wanted we we paid them properly. We gave them that space to shine, and we also wanted to brand in the way of like let's celebrate this amazing Chicano band and the music around them. And like we had it be like fifty fifty Spanish and English, and we wanted to make sure like yeah, we can have a super jam and not have it be traditionally just like some random, just like some random rock band that does like, just so, like some soft rock situation. We wanted to push the envelope. Then we were like, okay, let's see how Denver can get down with this Chicano band covering these amazing songs from all across like music history. And it's just like, it, it was so cool working with them on that. But it was something that we had to market the right way. So it's just like, okay, it will be in Spanish. There'll be a good deal in Spanish. So you're going to have to get comfortable with that and understand it's still going to be a good time, even though you may not traditionally go to something like that. And Andrea, I'd love to hear from you just like, you know, from the Latino and like, you know, we have Cinco de Mayo, obviously like the big thing, everybody comes out. Right. But, you know, just growing up knowing there's all these like Latino Chicano bands, you know, even from Mexico or other places. And it's like, that exclusion of like these bands will sell tickets we have a large latino population here they are huge in mexico or they're huge over here and it's like how come they can't get into the bluebird or how come they can't get into ogden because you know we buy tickets 
you know what I mean? And just you being familiar with that, um, you know, scene and that's like what, like, I think Mana was like booked at Red Rocks like five years ago or something, right? Like, like, and there's all these other bands coming up, right? Like, you know, tell them under, you know, you watch uh, growing up or whatever, you know, how do you deal with that? Or is there a way, you know, promoting is promoting, right? You put up the money, right? You get a good venue, you make it safe, you do the insurance or whatever. And it's like, maybe that's a way to do inclusion. It's like, hey, we're spotlighting some of these other bands that do sell tickets. We just have to market to the Latino community or that community. I just love to hear your perspective on that. I mean, you know, it, it, I, I've been really fortunate to get to learn from some really great stage producers and, and some of these radio folks that have really taught me a lot of things that, you know, they, they have access to a segment of bands that me, Andrea, doesn't have access to. And so I've been able to um, build relationships with those bands and, and watch them for myself and realize how really, how, how great they are. And um, it, it is a question that I ask myself, like, why, why aren't these bands more mainstream? Why, why don't I see them on channel two when they're highlighting a music band or, you know, things like that. I ask myself those questions a lot. And, um, you know, again, I think it, it goes back to what I said earlier is that I think we have to force the issue. Um, I think we have to really um, put ourselves um, uh, where we traditionally haven't been. And, um, and, and there's probably a lot of different venues for that. Um, the, the Mexican, the, 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 the very, and by the way, all the, all the various <laughs> genres of Mexican music, like you have no idea, you have no idea how much there is and, and, and how oh, amazing they are, how fucking amazing they are. And, um, they fill venues, they fill venues and it's, it is something to be seen. And um, I feel that there is um, the opposite that, that we need to, we need to, we need to force that music onto the mainstream, um, cultural music onto the mainstream somehow. And, and um, cause there's so many, just, just so much talent out there. Can I uh, talk to you about? Oh, this Go is ahead, John. Johnny. Yeah, no, can I talk about like getting bands on TV? Like, because it took us, it took me, I say us, it was really me, um, three months to negotiate with Channel 12 to get on statewide TV. And I think everybody here represents just, you don't give up. Um, and and with the bands that you you said, um, I know this guy named Henry Archuleta. I mean, I've I've heard some of those 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 bands that you were talking about. I said I would have never known about it if, if I hadn't been on on his station. And but you have to. I'm I'm saying I'm I'm old now. Young people, you're gonna have to come up, come across to to go to the station. Keep going, keep going, because I I kept going to the Channel 12 until I got the show on. And then even after we got you know hate mail and all that kind of stuff, you persist because you know that it's good to have diversity on television. It's good to have diversity in clubs. Exactly. And, and it's in, important for people to see that statewide as well as like within a club as well. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I, I just want to come in here because we talk about, I so saw I booked on television for several years. I play on the radio. You know, I think this comes back to, again, the people who are in the positions, right? If you know about these bands, because it's part of your culture. And I even, you know, after all this has really begun, after I read your article, Corey, I even saw some implicit bias. And I went and looked at my own play selection. And I was like, I need to put more Asian bands into my work. And I started calling up folks saying, where is this? Because I grew up in Chicano culture. Uh, black culture and Chicano culture are so intimately intertwined that, you know, playing black artists, you know, 102.3, we know that the many of these radio stations, I, I get these reports from the radio stations, that the top 10 art, the top 10 bands, um, you know, are all alt rock kind of indie rock folk music. Maybe if you're lucky, you see one electronic artist and that comes down to what DJs choose to play and what I choose to play, what other people choose to play and how we book. And I, that, you know, you kind of hit on that question when you were asking it earlier, um, Andy, because my question to Andrea was going to be like, you know, you're, when you create space, when you're in charge for people of color to create space for them to move up. But here's the thing. 
if we want to start putting these people into Red Rocks, if we want to start putting these people into the Fillmore, we might have to ask some of our white band friends to give up a day. Like the Lumineers might have to give up a day. And what does that mean to their money? What does that mean to their tour? Right? I mean, these conversations are going to happen and the bands are going to have to work it out, but who's in charge and who's doing the booking and who's doing the math is going to have to be either really keen on this diversity conversation or it needs to be a person who comes from a diverse background in my personal opinion. And I, I think that this is where we maybe can transition to these questions. I've seen a couple of them now, you know, where are women of color in this? Are, are these industries really accessible to us? Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I don't know, Andrea, if it's, it, it seems a faux pas to go to you first because you're on this panel, but you know, how, how do, what can we do to support that? Cause you know, like I said, I work with a lot of women in production, a lot of really amazing women in production, but not very many women of color in production at high levels. Hmm. I know that if more women were doing this work, <laughs> it would be, <laughs> it'd be better for everybody. <laughs> we'd be a, so much more organized. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be half the shit show it is right now, but, <laughs> and, and I, you, know, you could say that for women across, you know, all sectors, but, um, you know, I, I think that um, I, I, I think that, uh, again, <laughs> it, it goes back to what I was saying earlier is that it, it's intimidating. This work is intimidating, especially for women, especially when you go into a boardroom and it's all males. And, and then on top of that, you're a woman of color. And so you're, you begin to feel that um, you, insecure about your voice and you begin to feel insecure about if if you bring value to the to the conversation and um we have to change that mentality about ourselves um because um <laughs> do you guys remember do you guys remember that um those real estate agents that did that um fresh prince oh, of bel air oh, thing? Oh, you remember that oh, yeah. 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 okay okay yeah. and i told my husband i said i said i see you guys i said babe look at that look at that team of people had they had one person of color, one person of color on their staff, that they that would not have happened. They would not have lost the Coldwell or Coldwell, who I don't, whoever the hell they were with. They lost their whole, they lost their whole business because of that stupid ass video that they put out. And it's and it's <laughs> that's my point is that you know if if you if if people of color are injected into these spaces, we. <laughs> I don't know. I, we have to push that. We have to push the inclusion. We have to think that we have to. We have to change the paradigm that um, that it, oh, it's so hard to find the person of color, the right person of color for our team. It's so hard. I think people have this mentality that they can't. It's not achievable, and that's just an excuse, in my opinion. I, I think that you have to. People in all across all industries have to come at it like. We think we think we have to think we have to go there first before we go anywhere else, um, because again, a, 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 a diversity in gender, diversity in in ethnicity, and by the way, race isn't even a thing, folks. It's not even a thing. It's ethnicity. Um, that's what's valuable. That's what's going to make our brand, our who we are, relevant. Um, we that's what has to change. Um, and, you know, I, I, when I was on the Sunnyside Music Festival board, you know, people were like, well, you know, I know we're not very diverse, but let's, let's, let's form a committee. <laughs> I hate when organizations say, let's form a committee and let's, let's committee this. No, no, no. You got to adopt that as the culture of the company, of the organization. If you don't all value it, a committee's not going to solve your problem. And I, I hate how white folks go there first. Let's committee this. No, it's, it's got to be the first thing you think about. Um, and so, sorry, I, I talked Frank and I've been drinking wine all night. So I, I did want to answer just like to Kelsey specifically, like, I think I understand because, you know, you're, you're playing rock music and you're doing, you know, Kelsey is one of my students and she's awesome. She's a great guitarist and she's super great. Um, you know, but yeah, it's like, I know what you mean. It's like, there's these rock scenes, right? And it's like, there's certain bands that, you know, are playing and like, how do you break into that? Um, and I think, so there's twofold, two things I think about this here. First of all, if, if you are one of those bands or, 
you know, for me, if I'm in Flowbots, like, you know, I'm, you know, specifically might reach out to certain artists that I, I, I want to try to collaborate with, you know, like, um, like Kayla Marquis is an example of like, you know, kind of hush hush, but we'll see. We're, we're working on a song with her. We'll see how it goes. But, you know, with Flowbots to see like, hey, maybe we can get something going if we do that the right way at the right time with the right things that might give some extra love to her and, and, and elevate, you know, give some love to her. Um, so I'm always looking for artists like that to be like, how can I help her? can we maybe collaborate? And, and I think if more, you know, some of the indie rock bands or whatever, we're also kind of thinking like that, like, hey, here's this artist, like, you know, maybe I could write a song with them or maybe, I, you know, I could do something or they could, you know, it doesn't always have to be like, you have to open the show. Maybe you just come up and play guitar on a song, you know, like it can be really simple little things to be included into like a whole new gr uh, group of people. So little things like that, I, I think matter, but the other thing I would say, Kelsey, is, is, is also, and it is intimidating, but is also just reaching out and collaborating with people as much as possible. Because one thing I'm really trying to foster in my old age here in Colorado is, is and I'm doing kind of now with Flowbots and it, it's kind of breaking the norm a little bit, is doing songwriting sets. Like LA, Nashville, it's very common. You go, you write a song with somebody, you go the next day, you write a song with somebody else. And you do that, that's your job as a songwriter. And then that's, and then one of those happens maybe as a hit, right? Um, but through those, that's how you build these relationships, right? Oh, I wrote this song with this guy. This one didn't really work, but, or you come up, you, none of you have written a hit. And then one person writes a hit. And now all of a sudden they're bringing their crew with them to like write songs with big, big artists, right? So I think in a in sense of building community and especially in music, like the more you can reach out to collaborate with people, you know, like, or, or even just share ideas, be like, hey, I'm working on this, or, or it's like, hey, could, you know, would, would you mix this? Or would you give me some notes on this, you know, um, uh, or have somebody guest vocal on some, you know, like, and, and you know, there's gonna be rejection there. So people are gonna say no, like it's, the, you know, whatever, that's part of the music business, right? But if you're persistent, you might find somebody that you do build a relationship with, and then that in turn offers you that net network, um, you know for uh to do something so i think for women of you know like that's just a suggestion or whatever i think it's super super hard um for that and i think the more we can invite women of color to do things with us or collaborate or play or whatever that may be and build a relationship more than just like a facebook post or like a like on instagram or something <laughs> you know uh that's that's how i think you can we can help elevate elevate that so i you you might if you want to respond to that kelsey i just i i know you so i was trying to be more specific to you <laughs> you know, one thing that keeps coming across to me that you're saying andrea about this having to be a core principle you know those those realtors may have lost their licensure with whatever company that was but they went and started a new brokerage there was somebody who was willing to take them in yeah. so i think this conversation that we're having here as an entire system right i think the independent booking agents we're going to all have to collectively put pressure, I think, on these two big giants who are obviously not here at the table today to have a conversation about how we break into that. And we're going to have to talk about it together. And we're going to have to say it happens together. And that kind of union, I've heard a lot of people talking about, you know, unions for artists. Un we know about unions for laborers, right, that work in production. That, that, that kind of unified force might be the only way in which we can turn this upside down. It might be the only way now when everyone's been laid off and they're going to be rehiring for jobs that we can restructure the jobs that were not going to be accessible before COVID. Is my audio on right now? No, yeah. Can they, can yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so I was just going to respond to that. I think that that's brilliant. Um, I am in year seven of my band year 10 of being a musician and it is i think one of the things that stuck out to me when i was in your class andy was it's literally you can you can be in school for it but actually once you go through it it really is your education and i've learned yeah. so much and i don't think you will ever stop learning because there's always something new um i think what uh struck me about Corey's article is that realizing that the people that are that do have the power to make more change and to have more inclusiveness, um, it seems like it's just 
if you don't get out of your comfort zone and like actually knock down the door persistently and consistently, it just doesn't happen because then you get into the committee level. And I, the, the thing that sticks out to me the most, and I am sure you guys will probably know this is um, the picture that gets taken at the end of the year when it's selection time for hometown for the holidays. And then you look at it and I'm like, so the, the majority, 99% of the people are there are white. And I'm just like, this is, this is what we need to go towards to something where there's more people in the scene. There should be more people um, in the Latino community in that uh, sense of things. I know it's a more of a niche market thing, but I feel like they, the opinion is valid. And so um, I, when I see that, I'm like, that's what we're, that's what I think I work to do is to make sure that if those people are there, that they know who I am and that, um, and it's still a thing that I have to work on, on feeling comfortable getting out of there because it's very much so power trip and you at the bottom who just wants a, a chance and they can just slam the door and say, goodbye, I don't want you. But I think that is, the way that I see the inclusion being built more, but I know people are still struggling with the fact of uh, that they don't even get that chance, that fighting chance there. So I, I think that's, that's kind of just what I wanted to speak on. Can I piggyback off that real quick? Yeah. Yeah. So like even one of the bands I managed went through hometown for the holidays and it was really like, I had a really disgusting experience there from like the bartenders who almost threw me out because they didn't believe I was managing the bands. They wouldn't let me into the artist area and they refused to, even though I was like, this is like, I'm on the list. And I was like, one of the only people of color there. And I'm like being harassed by these people behind the bar. I'm just like, what, like I, I, <laughs> I belong here too. Just like anyone else who didn't question. Like I am the only person of color in this room and I'm having to go through hell and high water me almost ejected for just existing. And it's just like, I, I hate that. And to bounce off another point about women of color in the industry, I've gone, like I had mentioned, I've gone through so many of these music industry panels that pop up in Denver and they all love to pat themselves on the back for being like, we, we're bringing women to the workplace. But it's just like, that's cool, but that only applies to white women. And it's just like, and it's almost like they don't see that you, 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 there's, you've let people of color just like not be an issue for you. And it's just like, if you can, if you can ha be so proud that you brought women into the workplace, which should have happened a long time ago, why, like, where is that same dignity for people of color in general? And it's, it's not that hard. These people are out there. I see them. I meet them. And they need a place because, like, if there's not a place for them, then the shit that happened to me at hometown for the holidays will still happen. Because they don't, like, you're, it's, it's like you don't exist. It's like an eraser of, like, what you've done and what you, like, bring to the table. Johnny, do you think you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, people who are differently abled and their place in this industry. You know, uh, I know what it's like to be the only, you know, Latino at a table, but, you know, I think there's a lot of times where there's other Latinos at the table. And I feel like in this industry, I've, I've worked with very few people. Um, I've worked with artists, but not folks in the industry. And I think for a long time, everyone said these jobs have to be, can't be done at home, that they're not accessible to people. But now look at this transition. We're seeing how much can be done at home. So are we, again, are we in a place where people are differently able to need, uh, who need some accommodation, might be able to find it and find a place in this industry? Well, a lot of clubs that I booked, they first met me on the phone and they had no idea until I walked in the door because I walked with my, my stick and I sometimes I'll go with the musician. A lot of times I would go to musicians because some of the places are not accessible by buses. So get in the car, go to, I say, I'm doing this for you. I need you to come with me so we can, we can, so I can at least get there and do a face and face to face kind of thing. Um, uh, and, and then I've had a situation and since the hotel doesn't exist anymore where a club owner says, well, I want to pay you, but we don't have the check ready. Come back next week. 
and dealing with people like like that and, and saying, are you doing that? You have to sometimes get it out of mind. Are you doing that just because I'm visually impaired? Or do you do this, do that with with everyone? And then you find out, you know, this guy does it to, to everyone. So don't take it that that deeply and and just know that you tell everybody else, if you're going to deal with that club owner, they're going to jerk you around like that, right? And, and get the word out. Um, so working at home, because my, all my equipment is accessible, I find the clubs. I, 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 was, I was doing this at home long before this stuff happened. And, and, then, getting, and then when the internet came in, because I, I started before the internet, um, getting things on, it's definitely a lot more easier now that you can put tickets online and, and you, can, you can, for clubs that are not owned by Ticketmaster and whatever that, that stuff is, the, the local, local clubs, you can, you know, monitor your sales. And uh, it, it, like I said, just because I didn't, I didn't have another blind person, what's up, my, my partner, was he just, his family owns houses and stuff like that. So he, he's used to being, his father taught him all that stuff, how to manage. You can manage a house, you can buy a house, you can manage bands and all that, and all that kind of stuff. So I learned from him. Then I just jumped out there and then just got around other, you know, able-bodied sighted people and, and just try to melt in as much as I can and say, hey, forget the fact that I'm a blind person doing this. Let's just make the deal. Okay, you got paperwork, uh, contracts. You, you, I, I, I'm very good at reading contracts. I'll get them filled out, sign it, get it to you. And that's what I have to do with dealing with downtown. They, they have a contract. What you will do, uh, what your writer is going to be, and all, and, and all that stuff. And, and many of my businesses, which I, I often tell them, learn how to read a contract. I know you want to be a musician and that's all you want to do. But it's, know what you're getting into. And, and, and it's, it's great that you trust me, but trust yourself too. So dealing with, with that and, and making it accessible to me when there was no other person that, uh, that I could come alongside that were, was in the business that was just able to say, hey, I was there first. Here, I'll come back and, and show you, Johnny. Um, it made it uh, interesting but exciting at the same time because I, I realized you know, you're blazing new trails and it's, it's exciting to blaze something new and sometimes it's frustrating but it's exciting because you love the music. And, and this is just one part of that music and, and, and teaching the other guys how to do this so they can continue it after you get tired and say, I want to sit back and watch you guys. And so that's been my, my working and in, in, in just dealing with being the only blind guy that I know of, but knowing other blind positions, but just the only one in that other position as as booking agent and and that part. Hmm. You know this this is a, a question that I want to pose to everybody, and that is, you know, who was your mentor in this as you were growing in your field, and were they a person of color? Oh, can I go? I totally want to because I, I listening to John. I just totally thought about this, um, uh, and I don't know they, they definitely. I mean, I obviously I, I had a, a choir instructor that was a, a, a person of color, but um, I had this guy, his name is Dwayne Wilson, and he lived over on Capitol Hill, and he, um, you know, was a, you know a black guy. Um, he would uh, come see some of these high school bands that, that I was in, and I got connected through him. I think he was maybe like a counselor at a camp or something like that, but, um, you know, I met this guy when I was like 15 or 16 playing at the at Euphrates or whatever, and... Um, you know, he like, he taught me all about funk and parliament funkadelic and like, you know, all these things. And he was like my number one, um, incur like he encouraged me. He like believed in me, you know? He was like, oh, Andy, you know, just like do this. You know, you got something special. You can do this, you, you know? And um, for years, like, you know, uh, he just helped mentor me. And, and the guys in my band too, like uh, th this guy, Chris Harris, who played bass and Bob Schism, uh, 
you know, he's played at Chipotle. I mean, he's like one of the best bass players around, but man, he taught me everything about funk and groove and how to play and, you know, and taught me how to be a better guitar player, a better funk player, a better singer, you know? Um, so I had so many people of color, you know, mentoring me uh, and from a young age and, you know, maybe getting exposed to racism and a lot of these things early on when a lot of these guys with me or, you know, we're playing the show or, whatever it is, and they're harassing him, you know, <laughs> and having to be like, what are you doing? Like, this guy's with me, like, you know, he's, he's with the band or, or whatever it may be. And so I learned really early on to like, advocate, you know, like, because he's, you know, basically part of my family. He's there supporting me, supporting the band, giving us his wisdom, his knowledge, his experience, um, just to see the scene be better. And, you know, um, so I just wanted to jump in that because I was just thinking about what a huge impact he had on me. I'm a 16 year old kid and there's a, you know, black guy coming and being like, Hey, you're, you're like, you're kind of funky. And like, let me show you all the ways <laughs> of, of everything, you know? Uh, and really like had such a musical impact on me. Andrea, Corey, you want to, you want to go next? Um, sure. Uh, sure. I'll real quick. Yeah. Um, I've been, I've been a part of Cinco de Mayo since I was eight years old. So I kind of, I just kind of grew up um, being forced to go to that event and, and being a part of it in some way, shape or form. I, I literally worked soda booths to, you, you name it. I wasn't, you know, I had to do anything I was asked to do. And so it's just kind of how I came to love events. You would think I'd hate events, but I actually really, really love events, and I love them so much because it's the it's the one medium that really brings people together in in a happy setting. They just want to have a good time. They just want to be connect. I think I feel people want to be connected with their community and their and 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 their and 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 come together to celebrate you know a certain thing and and have fun. That's what people want to do. I mean that's and then you then you add Colorado to it, and then you add Denver to it, and we're such a fantastic city to be in. I mean, the secret's out, right? So um, I grew up in it, but also when I when I got older and really started learning the nuts and bolts of you know how to put contracts together, how to talk to people, how to work out a deal, how to you know um, how to organize, I really learned a lot of that from um, Renee Ortiz. Um, she's somebody we still contract, uh, for Cinco and she, um, she, she's taught me a lot. Um, it, there, there have been methods that I have just picked up by watching her, um, that, that have been priceless to me. And, and when I really am stuck and I'm really, uh, I really am having a hard time, let's say with a sponsor or, you know, um, the, a low rider car club, <laughs> you name it. If I'm having a hard time, I'll go to Renee and be like, Renee, pretend you're me. What would you do in this situation? And, and we talk it out and, and, you know, we're usually able to figure things out. And then it gives me, she always gives me a perspective that I don't always come with initially. And I think having, um, having people on your side, on your team that have a perspective that um, you don't always have is very valuable. And so, um, I've, I've, I've learned a lot, a great deal from her. And, um, um, you know, I think she's been one of my, my, my best event mentors. <laughs> um, for me, I, I don't think I ever really had much of a mentor. It was most, a lot of it was just self-driven to be the change that I wanted to see in the industry. I, yeah, I just never had anyone in my corner to just be like, hey, this is how you do this, this is how I do this. So I would do everything I could. If I didn't know something, I would just like learn it myself. And so like when younger kids and other people do see me at the table or even just like making sure I, I'm there, that they also can be like, okay, there's a place for me. And so, like, if I didn't have a mentor, I hope I can be that to someone else by just existing. And even if, like, they need to pick my brain of what it's like to be a minority in this industry, like, I can be that for them. How about you, Johnny? Well, okay, I, I would have to say, like, sometimes you, you watch someone 
who has a good business sense. And, and I'm a, a people person, but I needed to, what I needed really help was, was that, that business part. And, and my, my partner, Wayne, he, he's from a family that they started out buying houses and, and doing all that stuff. And so he was the person that if I couldn't say no, he had the face that said no. So I would bring him along and say, you know, if, if, it, was, if it was something, I, I, I don't know, tap him. He would take over. So my, my partner, Wayne Turner, I mean, he was the one that, that gave me the, the business. And, and even when I messed up, because one time I, we bought some radio time and it was over our heads and, and I made a mistake. I signed the contract and it was a mistake. He said, okay, you made the mistake. I'll pay it over. And he never brought it back up to me again about that mistake. Right? So I've had mentors... Uh, along the way that, you know, when I made a mistake, uh, they've been gracious enough to, to, to help me correct that mistake, and then we can take it to the, to the next level. And that, you know, so, so, so that always kept me, like, humble in what, what I do. Um, I have a high school friend, uh, uh, Peter, who works on our web, website. We, we've known each other for years. And and, and just like you had little parts of pieces of people that, that, that came along with you and, 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 and they saw your gold and they were one with your goal. And though you were the front person, you had team members that were sometimes invisible, but they always su su supported you. And, uh, and that has been like, like a, a big blessing to me, just those people that come along and you never thought that, you know, these people could help you in this way, but they say, hey, I, I got the skill, I got the skill, and, you, and they pull from it and they're gracious enough to let you in on what they know so you can add it to your, your list of things that you know to, to cut these deals and, and, and to get other people into places because it's all about helping the, the community of musicians, the community of, of artists and, and not being afraid to go from one level to another level. So, yeah. So I, will I, think that's, I think that's great. I just want to share my experience really quick with y'all. You know, I kind of got my break in simultaneously in large events with city park jazz and also television with Denver eight at the same time. And, um, there's a gentleman, David DeManna, who is, um, he's Brown. He's Italian. He grew up in the North side. He understands the culture. He worked in Denver eight and in politics. And they actually plucked me out from working at city council. And we're like, you want to be a host on this TV show? Um, they, because they do channel eight is the government access channel. Um, they also do city council meetings. So they started seeing me at the front row at Red Rocks and they'd be like, Whoa, you seem to know a lot about music. We're going to want to launch this music show. And that was really my first break. And he, he's, um, you know, done there's almost as many shows as chuck morris over the years filming them talking with them hanging out backstage doing the production he really taught me a lot um one thing he always told me was like not to eat he doesn't eat on the days of big uh productions in the morning because he doesn't want to get his stomach upset and ruin his whole day when he's trying to do these big things and then you know over at um you know city park jazz that was when chris zacker was there and i went on like i said to become the vice president of city park jazz and now he is over there at levitt and um he taught me a lot about how to work the partnerships with the city to get what you want and how you can uh, work out the right deals and also push the boundaries. You know, he really empowered me to push the boundaries when it came to sustainability and environmentalism in events. And I think that was really important for me. And, um, you know, I, I'm thinking, I've been thinking about this question since I asked it of you of like, when did I know that I made it? And, um, you know, I do the underground music showcase for community engagement and I love it. But when Grand Doozy came here, because I had been on the parks board, I wrote them and I said, I would really love to do your community engagement. And I didn't get an answer. I even had the councilman push my resume for me. And then I got an article in 303 Magazine um, after my great work with the um, community engagement at UMS and they called me. And they said, you know, we're running into problems here at the end. We really love it if you come in. Ended up managing their whole um, complaint system during the thing. And I knew I made it when Superfly gave me a W-2. Never once had I had someone match me in my taxes. Never once in the events industry. So many times I had people rob me of my wages. 
underpay me what they said they were going to pay me, sweat me forever. But someone to match my taxes, that's really when I felt like I hadn't finally made it uh, in the industry somewhat. Um, you know, we're coming down to the last 10 minutes here. And there's a question that we really, when we were going over this, that we really wanted to go through. And that is, what is the question you wish you were asked? And who's missing from this table? And you know, hopefully, Sheena, you're taking notes for all the people that everyone lists off. If there's people in the chat that want to throw in names, I mean, like, you know, this is a series. We want to really develop this conversation. It can't just happen once. Ian, uh, this is yeah. Barb Dye, president. I, I finally mm -hmm. showed up. Um, Hi. I, I do have some comments that I would like to add, but I really want to hear uh, the answers to this last question you have. Well, hi, Barb. We'll get to you at the end then. Anyone want to go first? Ian, did you want to repeat it? Or? Sorry, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Sorry, the the question talking. is, what, what question do you wish you were asked, and who's missing from, well, who's one person that's missing from this conversation? Hmm. Uh, well, there's always more people that can be added to the conversation. Um, I think this is actually a pretty good job of trying to include some diversity and people from a lot of different backgrounds, you know, you can only have so many people on a panel. Um, so I, I think, I, I think that was very well done. Um, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, potentially just like another, you know, like a, a booker or somebody from, you know, like, I mean, Chris Zacker is pretty pro progressive. I like him a lot, but just like, you know, somebody from Levitt, somebody from Live Nation or AG or somebody to kind of like, you know, hit back, you know, a little bit and be like, oh, okay, well, here's what it might, you know, and just hear that, I think sometimes you get some of those folks who are there, you know, it opens their eyes a little bit more or whatever. So, you know, I think that's the only thing in my, in my opinion, but uh, you know, overall, I'm very stoked to meet a lot of you. And I don't think I've really actually gotten to connect with Corey. So I'm, um, uh, please, please email me, Corey, and we'll, we'll chat some more or whatever, but um, you know, or Andrea, you know, some of these folks. So, um, uh, but yeah, that's, that's my thought is just having some more, Folks like that just to be, you know, hear their side and, and talk and, you know, the ones that are booking Red Rocks or booking the 7,000 person things and be like, okay, well, why is that? Or why, why aren't we doing this? Or, you know, why aren't we booking more bands like this? And, you know, because I think it's a real world conversation, you know, it's like, oh, well, what about tickets? It's like, well, how come they can't open for this band? Or are you looking, actively looking for bands of color? Are you, you know, like, are you just taking leads from your intern? <laughs> you know, like, how are you making those decisions, you know? And what a great topic for a panel at the CFEA conference, having, having, having AEG at the table and those bookers and <laughs> Andy and, and, and mus actual musicians at the table to talk about um, the music industry as it relates to the special event um, industry um, and the, the best way to go about um, working with these two, two types of groups. Um, you you uh, you and I should put that together at the next conference, the next in person conference, not these Zoom meetings, but the actual conference. Um, I'd be I'd be happy to work with you on that. But I agree with Andy. I think that you need more people because we're, we're all these people in this this chat right now. We're all preaching to each other's choir. We're all on the same page with each other. I think and 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 who who we need to influence are the folks that need to hear that they're not being inclusive and we need to figure out who those folks are and um, call them out on it, I suppose. And, um, you know, there are other, as you know, <laughs> ancillary advocacy organizations out there that would lend their voice as well. Um, um, so. Yeah. And I would like to, let, I would like to like see like, um, like bigger, big sponsors. Uh, one time I had a chance to talk to the, the, uh, this guy who's working for Coors, and uh, he's a black gentleman, and it was the Cash 22. I said, well, can you guarantee me you can get 200 or more people to this concert? And because I was very young in this thing, I couldn't guarantee him because I, I thought about, well, what if I don't get 200 or more people there? So uh, big corporations with our sponsors that can be willing to take a chance, like we take a chance, there must be some big sponsors that tax write off, take a chance on sponsoring the smaller guys. 
And that's it. How about you, Corey? I Sorry. feel like I feel like Johnny needs to teach a master class <laughs> to the to the to the young people that want to be in in this industry. I, you have a lot to teach, I think, Johnny. In fact, I, I don't I don't know you, and I, I feel like I would love to just sit with you for <laughs> take you out for coffee and pick your brain for hours. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've I've heard a lot of crazy stuff in this business, and and <laughs> I, I I just know what is the bottom line. And the bottom line, I want to get everybody paid. And I learned from a long time ago, I had a boss that she paid me less money and, and she got mad at me because I wanted to make $2 more. And then when I went and, and made $15 more, she got mad at me because I left her place. Um, so I, I, uh, I just understand that you, you love doing what you do, but let's try to get you, pay. I know it's not the most important thing, you love your music, but let's try to get you paid so you can make a living out of this as well because we want more of your energy we want more of what you can produce and and freedom to to, to do that without doing the nine to five and sometimes you may have to do a nine to five but you know let's let's work towards more than one goal of just yeah you know. oh, oh anyway that's my frustrating <laughs> go ahead well how about if i go ahead and do my little uh, spiel here, real but, quick. Before you go, but Barb, before okay. you go, can we let can we let Corey answer? Oh sure, I'd love to have Corey answer that. He's he's the whole reason we're all here. <laughs> can you remind me of the that the, the basis of the question? Um, what question do you wish you were asked, and who, what other person do you think should be at this table? Oh yeah, oh definitely for the people need to be on the table it should be these promoters that like. Do run a lot of this thing. Like Kelsey mentioned it, but like the AG folks and the Live Nation folks, it'd be really nice to see them in on the conversation. Because I feel like thus far you haven't seen much from them in terms of like addressing it. This thing's been going on and they have hands down the most power in terms of the live music scene. And it would be a great sign that they're willing to change if they were a part of it. And I guess I think Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Corey. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> oh, you can, you, can keep, you can keep going. Oh, sorry. No, I was going to say, like, Live Nation, you know, like, obviously, like, you know, I have relationships with some, some of these folks, and I think um, I think some of them are definitely are, you know, will, probably willing to have a little bit more of that conversation, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously you're dealing with conglomerates and corporations and a lot yeah. of other stuff, but I, I think where, where we start is with the people who are willing, more willing to have the conversation. Um, and I, I feel that a little bit more from the Live Nation folks than I do from the AEG folks, um, like Ricky or Jeff or, or, or those folks. I feel like they're, it's a, they're kind of in a, you know, rock and harvest, but I think they're, they're wanting to have that conversation, you know? Um, so, you know, that maybe that's something we do in the future or, you know, or even, you know, these are great panels are awesome, but also just like small conversations as well do a lot of good as well, even if it's just a few people, because maybe they're more comfortable to, to have some of those and like you get real change happening because, uh, you know, they can have address some of those concerns privately and then bring it up to a bigger, bigger forum or whatever. So um, this me and you definitely keep rapping about that for sure, man. Because I think there's some people who are and some people who aren't. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Barb, I just wanna, Go ahead. I just want to say, I'm going to give Barb her space, and I want to say thank you to everyone yeah. being here. I've seen in the chat a few times here a seat at the table. I've been the only person at the table before. Your voice is drowned out. So if we have allies that are turning into accomplices, please know you can't change this one person at a time. That if you're going to change the structure of your company, bringing in a, a, more than one person or expanding your board, perhaps if you had to, two or three people so that you could bring in a class of people together. It is extremely difficult to do this on your own. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult to do this even in a company on your own. And that's why I'm so glad that we were able to bring everyone today. And I want to say thank you to Combo. And we're trying to bring on other groups like IOTSI and the Festival and Event Association to say how we collectively stand together to make this change that we want to see. And now it's your turn, Bob. <laughs> okay. 
Well, first of all, I had a lovely little introduction written, and I'll just skip that. But I do want to thank Angela for hosting this again. And, of course, for all, all of you panel members, I, I truly, truly appreciate you taking your time to talk to us. And I agree with you. I think we're all kind of preaching to the choir here. But it has to start somewhere. And uh, so we can write a little article on this. All of us can write articles and send it out. I know that there are people on our mailing list that are at Live Nation and uh, AEG and that that hopefully would see this. So um, real quick announcement. We do not have board meetings and stuff set for uh, August and September yet because of the COVID. Uh, <clears throat> our plans are to get back to a couple of programs that we had to postpone for March and April. We've also ordered face masks with the combo logo on them. Hopefully we can get those out pretty good uh, pretty soon. So I want to add, too, that we participate in school career days. We speak at high schools and colleges. We offer workshops like band management and how to get radio airplay. And one of the main goals of our meetings is to connect people with the people they need and vice versa. For instance, <clears throat> people say, well, uh, why would you have a recording studio guy come out and talk? Well, he needs clients too. The bands need a recording studio. So everybody here can help each other out. And, and that's one of the main goals of our meetings is to connect people with each other. Uh, Andrea mentioned going out and pushing your way in, and that is so true, especially for women and women of color. I, uh, when I started, I wanted to book a band at the Broadway, which was painted all black, and it was so dark and scary in there. I almost left. I really did. But I thought if I want to manage and book bands, I'll have to learn to deal with this, so I stayed. Eventually, I got in with the buyers at Bangles and Gold Rush and out-of-town venues. And then I actually got to book opening acts for several shows at the Fillmore for Barry Fay. And then Barry decided to leave and go uh, promote basketball teams. Uh, for Andrea and, uh, I'm sorry, the student that was on the line, I didn't catch your name. Um, I ran into a lady one night when I was making posters for a nightclub. And she, tiny little lady, I'll bet she wasn't 4'10", and she was Hispanic. And she came over and looked at my posters. And this is 2 o'clock in the morning. And so we got to talking, and it turned out she was sent here from MCA shortly after the San Francisco earthquake. She gave me a business card, and we talked, and she was actually uh, a buyer and looking for bands all the time, uh, especially in the California area. And I asked her how she got into it. She said she was the receptionist at MCA, and two of the head guys were hand standing there one night, and they wanted somebody to go check out a band. Nobody was available, and so she waved her hand. She didn't let the opportunity go by. And she said, I'll go check them out for you. Well, somebody was better than nobody. So she got out, and the short of the story is she ended up working her way up the ladder that way. So you guys step in there when you hear that door open, okay? Uh, as far as Hispanic bands, I went and I got a foot in the door with Lewis at the Palladium, and I was going to book Latino bands. Great place for them. Uh, then the no smoking ban went into effect. Lewis lost a lot of money uh, fighting that and ended up tearing the club down and selling the land. It was so sad. Um, and then uh, somebody mentioned, oh, Corey mentioned, you know, trying to get backstage. Uh, same deal. I mean, uh, women, you know, if you're, you have to really totally convince them that you're with the band seriously, you know, and they won't let you in. So anyway, um, we do offer a, a lot, and we hope that you guys will keep an eye on us, and uh, we'd love to work with you again. love to be able to do something at UMS again next year. A couple of years ago, uh, we worked with uh, uh, David. Oh, my God, this thing just went right out the window. <laughs> Ratner. And uh, Andy Ard when they put on a little bit of a seminar. And so keep us in touch. And whoever's running this, Sheena, David, somebody, <laughs> I'll let you have it back. Thanks, Barb.
we're at, we're at the top of the hour anyways. Um, just want to give a big shout out and appreciation to all of our guests and everyone for joining tonight. Um, stay tuned. Uh, there's more to this series to come. Um, and everybody have a great night.